desde que México se va a Sí. Good evening, everyone. As executive director of the Mexican Cultural Institute, it is my privilege to welcome you here today. We are delighted to have you with us this evening to share in our series, Age of Revolutions, Rethinking Mexico's Independence from a Hemispheric Perspective. Thank you all for coming and from logging in online. 2021 marks the, the bicentennial of Mexico's proclamation of independence throughout the month of September. Mexico's proclamation of nationhood rippled across large swaths of territories in present North America, California, and the whole Southwest, as well as Central America. We should also remember that this year, many other Latin American countries celebrate 200 years of independence. This was an age of American revolutions, to borrow a term coined by historian Kiklin Fitz, present here today. It started with a declaration of independence in Philadelphia in 1776 and ended in Chukisaka in 1825. But we are also here to celebrate National Hispanic Heritage Month, recognizing the achievements of Hispanic American and Mexican American communities, their contributions to the history and culture of the United States, Mexico, and North America as a whole cannot be understated. The observation of Hispanic heritage began, began in 1968 at, as Hispanic Heritage Week under President Lyndon Johnson and was expanded by President Ronald Reagan in 1988 to cover a 30-day period. It was eventually enacted into law on August 17, 1988. I believe that exploring our shared uh, past and history is a very important aspect of this month of observation. To that end, we welcome scholars, students, and performers to delve into our shared past and culture, starting a conversation between public history and cultural diplomacy to explore the meaning of independence as a shared experience across the Americas. This shared experience was not merely one of conflict, but also of mutual admiration and collaboration among nations in the hemisphere. This series of public programs is the result of an exciting binational collaboration with university partners in Mexico and the United States. The program is hosted collaboratively by the Mexican Cultural Institute of the Embassy of Mexico in the United States, the Latin America in a Globalizing World Initiative at Johns Hopkins University, and the Instituto de Investigaciones Históricas, UNAM. We would like to thank these institutions for the spirit of collaboration and teamwork. The event will conclude with a day-long virtual conference on September 27th, hosted by the Instituto de Investigaciones Históricas de la UNAM. This virtual conference will highlight consolidated and emerging scholars working on Mexican independence and will serve as a springboard for future collaborations between the Instituto de Investigaciones Históricas and the Mexican Cultural Institute. We would like to thank the director of the Instituto de Investigaciones Históricas, Dr. Elisa Speckman, and her predecessor, Dr. Ana Carolina, Carolina Ibarra, along with her team and staff at the Institute. Their support has been invaluable. Special thanks to the scholars who travel to be here, but also to those who are connecting virtually or joining us from the DMV area. That many of you have taken the time to be here serves as a reminder of just how important our cultural bonds are. Thank you to the speakers, moderators, musicians, dancers, and chefs, as well as to the teams of the institutions that made all of this possible. Thank you to all the attendees and the audience. Your presence here today online and online will certainly enrich this conversation. Without your support, our efforts would not have found fertile ground. Thank you and welcome to this. Oh, good evening. Thank you all for being here with us today. Um, my name is Lisa Lertz. I'm a professor of history at John Hopkins University. Um, I'm one of the, the co conveners of this event. So, firstly, we want to thank all of you for being here. I want to thank the team and staff at the Institute of here for putting on this wonderful event today and over the next few days. Um, we're very excited to start collaborating in a more formal way. Uh, uh, with the, the Mexican Cultural Institute, as well as with our colleagues at the Institute of Guests, in the 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 Guests, in the
Executive Director each week um, for her kind introduction and for making all of this possible today. So uh, I am pleased to present our first panel for our first conversatorio, our first conversation, uh, which is on Mexican independence in Latin American perspectives. And we hope that you'll be able to join us over the next few days for the, the, the following conversations on uh, independence in US and Mexican contexts, as well as on commemorations. Um, of Mexican independence in the United States and in Mexico. So today I'm pleased to welcome uh, three wonderful scholars to the stage with me. We have Marcela Echeverri Munoz from Yale University, where she's an assistant professor of history. She's the author of Indian and Slave Royalists in the Age of Revolution, Reform, Revolution, and Royalism in the Northern Andes, 1780 to 1825, and innumerable articles, book chapters, and special issues. She's currently working on a book that will recast Grand Colombian slavery and anti-slavery in the 19th century as central to understanding the meanings of freedom in the Atlantic world. Next to her, we have Jordana Dim. Professor Dim is a professor of history at Skidmore College, author and editor of numerous books and special issues, including From Sovereign Villages to Nation States, City, State, and Federation in Central America, 1759 to 1839. Las, declar Las Declaraciones de Independencia, Los Textos Fundamentales de, la, de las Independencias Americanas, and Centro América Durante las Revoluciones Atlánticas, El Vocabulario Político, uh, El Vocabulario Político. <laughs> and finally, we have Alfredo Avila, who's a professor of history at the Instituto de Investigaciones Históricas at the UNAM. He's written extensively about Mexican independence in various contexts, including working with Professor Dim and one of our speakers tomorrow, Professor Erika Pani, on the volume Las Declaraciones de Independencia, Los Textos Fundamentales de las Independencias Americanas, as well as the Diccionario de la Independencia de México and Para la Libertad, Los Republicanos en Tiempos del Imperio. Uh, we're going to start our conversation and from some very basic questions about how independence took place in Latin America, give you a sense of kind of a traditional history of what happened in the late, late 18th and early 19th century, and then delve into some of the ways that these historians and others are kind of complicating and rethinking the ways that independence played out across the Americas. So um, Professor Echeverri has kindly volunteered to do kind of a broad strokes of the process of independence. Um, across the Americas. So I'm, I'm going to hand it over to her to start us off. Thank you, Katie, and thank you. Good evening, everybody. Thank you for being here. And I did want to talk about the broad strokes narrative, but actually by thinking about what does it mean to talk about Latin American independence in the age of revolution, which is very interestingly the, the, frame we, the framing that we have uh, proposed for this uh, discussion. So to think about Latin American independence in the age of revolution is to really see it intrinsically connected to broader processes in the Atlantic world. And this means that we zoom out from the previously established narratives that were much more focused on nations, individual nations like Mexico, for example, to think about connections and uh, transnational processes. Uh, a very good starting point for doing that actually is to think about the Napoleonic invasion of the Iberian Peninsula, which is precisely a way of linking Latin America or Spanish America and the Spanish Atlantic world with the French Revolution, which obviously had preceded it, but at that time they became linked. So when Napoleon Bonaparte invaded the Iberian Peninsula, he basically sparked an incredibly transformative process, which as historians we know as uh, the monarchical crisis, the Spanish monarchical crisis, which was really irreversible, I would say, and had very deep connections with a process that could again be 
called the Latin American independence, uh, in which during the 19th century, but in particular in that first decade, starting with 1808 until 1821 could be a good day if you want to, to commemorate specifically that year, Latin America really becomes a laboratory, some historians like to call it, of political experimentation, where various forms of government are going to be uh, tried out, constitutions are going to be tested, and also multiple electoral processes are going to start developing and getting people from all classes uh, involved. So what is really at the heart of this process, and I will say kind of the crucial words, it's really the emergence of popular sovereignty as the form of legitimating both authority and uh, government. So through the adoption of these uh, Republican governments that were based on the principle of, of uh, popular sovereignty, um, we, we can look at three different layers of, of, of the transformations that I think are important for, for just laying out this very basic outline, uh, which is the redefinition of, on the one hand, norms, on the other hand, uh, institution, and finally, obviously, practices, right, across the board. Um, just three final points that have to do also with what types of transformations we are seeing, uh, and this is based also on the work of uh, historian Hilda Sabato, who has done a really great uh, synthesis of, of not only the scholarship, but really in theorizing these transformations. We see, on one hand, the emergence of elections as, as you know, standard and, and very foundational institutions for the creation of citizenship also uh, as a means of uh, you know, granting rights to, to popular uh, groups and, and other classes. Also the emergence of armed citizenship. And this leads me to think about the question of military mobilization, which we tend to think much more about uh, because of the question of the wars of independence, right? But we should also put this alongside the question of citizenship at the uh, electoral level. And the final point is really the question of public opinion, which becomes really another rich and fundamental arena in which uh, political ideas are being transformed, created, and then eventually also uh, shared. So I will leave it there for now, and then we can continue building on this narrative together, or obviously eventually have questions from the audience to to continue talking about what these revolutionary processes are or, or where. Thank you so much for that, uh, Professor Tibeti, and for kind of laying out some of the, the base, basic ideas and concepts that we want to keep in mind as we're thinking about this. As you mentioned, there will be time at the end. If any of you have questions, we'll open up for more of discussion and with the audience as well. So please keep those in mind as, as we speak and, and we'll have an opportunity for you all to take part in this as well. Um, one of the things you, you pointed to, uh, Marcela, was kind of a, a, a set of years that you indicated as maybe 1808 to 1821 as the period of independences. And I think, Professor Dim, one thing that we had talked about maybe you pointing to was, well, when was independence? We all celebrated it 10 years ago. There was a bicentenario in Mexico, at least, in, in 2010, that was a huge national set of celebrations, and now we're celebrating it again. Um, so I was wondering if you could kind of talk us through when independence might be marked a little bit. Thank you, and thank you for that very nice transition. Um, I'm, I'm a person who was born and raised in the country that we're currently located in. So in the United States where um, the, the focus of independence is often, if you say to a North American, when's independence? Well, obviously July 4th, 1776, right? As if there was no question, as if there was only one date to play with, but that declaration of independence, which the US is very fond of celebrating, um, is a moment in a much longer process. So when in that moment, uh, 10 years ago, when many of us were actually uh, looking at in the, the range of, of independence movements in the Americas in the context of Atlantic revolutions, um, there were a lot of different people who were ignoring 
the, the moments in Spanish America when in fact those acts, which were often coming out of city councils in the beginning years, in the early uh, period, uh, Marcella mentioned Napoleon's invasion of Spain in 1807, 1808, kicking off a series of moments, the Spanish crown, which had been very strong and unquestioned in many ways for hundreds of years, suddenly places were going, hmm, do we recognize the French on the throne? Do we not? What do we do next? There's this new king, Fernando VII. Do we support him? Do we support all of these? Suddenly politics was open in the Spanish American world. The crown was weak and there were options. And so throughout the hemisphere, city councils were getting together, juntas or, or regional organizations were forming. They were looking to Spain, but they were also looking locally. And there is precisely this sort of really amazing outpouring of documents based on Spanish legal tradition um, that came straight out of, well, what do you do? You get together with your local authorities, you summon them to a meeting, uh, you decide what you want to do. And so in Spanish America, one of the really interesting things is these actas, which are now recuperated by many countries as independence documents, start getting issued in 1808 and 1809 um, by local authorities that already exist. Um, but they're kind of negotiation documents. In um, Nicaragua, they famously call it the Acta Nublado or Acta de los Nublados, till the clouds pass. We'll be independent until we can sort this out. They're trying to figure out what to do because if the king comes back and says, <clears throat> and wins the war, they're gonna get in trouble. So in the Spanish American world, there's this really nice segue from the actas that happen in city councils um, to eventually to juntas, regional groups that are agreeing that they're gonna take a policy and make a choice to eventually by the time of around 1820 to 1821 when legislatures are being summoned, um, when the wars of independence seem like they're reaching um, outcomes that will lead to actual separation from Spain as the Madre Patria, suddenly it's legislatures, elected people who are issuing documents. And so the content as well as the form is changing. And for a long time, a lot of people said, oh, well, you know, they're just copying the US. They're not copying the US. They're actually pulling ideas from France, from the United States, from their fellow mm -hmm. citizens, from the Spanish political tradition of constitutional monarchy that really takes off in the, around the early um, mid 1810s. And so you wind up by the end of the period with declarations that complain about Spain or complain that Spain is a bad governor because it's too far away. And, and the language really depends on what people want to achieve. And it's a process that goes on um, up until, if you will, the early 1900s, the bulk of the moment is really this moment um, where Tierra Firme, the mainland, becomes independence. Um, but the Dominican Republic, for example, declares it, it celebrates its independence. Do you know who it celebrates its independence from? Haiti, which invades it in the middle of the 19th century. So eventually they become independent from Spain, but their national imaginary doesn't care about that. They're separate from Haiti. Um, and Panama in 1903 is probably the last country um, to declare independence, again, from Gran Colombia, from Colombia. And so the, the independence movements, if you look at these documents, which I encourage you to do, they're all very different and they depend a lot on the time and the moment and the people who are making those declarations. Thank you for that. Um, yeah, and it's, it's especially because we're celebrating the bicentenario to think of independence lasting into the, into the 20th century, where you know, again, Panama is a hundred and a bit years out, is, is a very much more extended period than our very firm 1776 year. Um, so one of the things you mentioned there was that, that these city councils and kind of local organization was where a lot of these documents started and where this move towards independence came from. And Marcella, I was wondering if you could talk to us a bit about kind of who is taking part. I'm, I'm not imagining, you know, in city councils, I don't see Bolivar sitting there. I don't see our kind of, you know, major important heroes of the revolution. Who, who are these kind of, are they elites? Are they non-elites? Are they kind of everyday people? Who's, who's taking part and how are people taking part in these revolutionary movements? Well, that's a, a really great question because uh, one of the things that we've been doing uh, all of us, you know, we really are representing here a very large community of historians that have been digging into this past and rethinking the independence processes. And again, one of the things that we've been doing is to 
incorporate different social sectors into the narrative of independence. So if the city councils is a trickier question, the way you asked it, it might have been more of an elite population that nonetheless was in dialogue, uh, partly because of the uh, unprecedented nature of the, of the process, right, of the moment, but also because there was a very large mobilization and, and, and people in the city councils did need people uh, from the popular classes to become uh, um, involved militarily in these um, changes and then and, and to be on their side, so to speak. So I don't want to get ahead into the royalism question, so I'll stick to the, uh, the insurgent um, like question that you asked me. And I will say that we don't want to uh, picture these people already knowing what they were going to do, right? Which is one of the, the tricky parts of uh, retelling a story that we already know. And that somehow, like Jordana was just saying, is so tied to our own identity and the way that we have been uh, constructing ideas about, you know, like the, the, the nature of our countries or, or our, our nations, right? Uh, in fact, it was a very open-ended process and a big part of what was going on was precisely the negotiation of the terms of these political alliances between, as I said, perhaps the people in the, in the uh, councils that Jordana was mentioning, uh, the declarations that they were drafting and how they were being interpreted on the other side by people who on one hand may not have been literate, but were also very much not only embedded in this process, but very interested and mindful of any opportunity that they could uh, latch into to gain certain benefits uh, in their participation in these independence processes. So again, we have to think about this as involving all sectors of society and really widespread uh, geographically as well. It's not something that is taking place exclusively in cities. It's not exclusively uh, uh, an urban process, but also um, impacting rural areas uh, very dynamically. Thank you. Um, for, uh, Professor Avila, I was wondering if you could kind of return us momentarily. I think we want to spend a lot more time talking about kind of popular participation and the ways that we're broadening who is taking part in independence. But there is also something, especially in this space and in this event where we're trying to think across national, well, what become national boundaries, to think about the connections and kind of who is talking to who and how are people across the Atlantic within Latin America and kind of how are, how are ideas being communicated? What sort of ideas are, are kind of in circulation um, in this moment and, and who is doing that sort of talking to each other um, uh, across what become national boundaries? Yes, well, uh, thank you, and, and thanks to the Mexican Institute for the uh, invitation. Uh, there, uh, there were no countries, uh, 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 there were no nations in, in 1920. The, the, is, uh, the first uh, country in, in that year was the Republic of Colombia, La Gran Colombia, uh, uh, but uh, the, other, the other countries, except for the, the provinces of South America, uh, Rio de la Plata and, and uh, the, the present Argentina, uh, there, are, there are no, uh, no uh, uh, identities or, or national identities. So uh, people have identities very, very uh, ambiguous. Uh, by, uh, I, I think in, in some people like, like, like Lucas Salaman, Lucas Salaman was a, uh, uh, Spanish. He, he was born in Guanajuato, Mexico. He uh, he was an uh, uh, he was a Spanish uh, in Guanajuato and in uh, in, in uh, the community of Indians and mestizos in in, in uh, that province. And but he was American uh, against the Spanish, the the European Spanish. Uh, he was from Guanajuato against the people of Mexico City. So uh, the, the identities are very uh, ambiguous in, 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 the, in, in the age. And uh, that explains why the, the interest and the, uh, uh, and the participation of some people are uh, uh, from Venezuela, from Nueva Granada, from uh, Buenos Aires in the Mexican independence is important. Uh, uh, I, I remember that Servando Teresa de Mier, 
the first, the first historian of the Mexican independence, wrote uh, the Historia de la Revolución de Nueva España in London and uh, published in London in 1813. And he uh, uh, dedicated the book to the Pueblo de Argentina, to the people of Argentina. And uh, in, in the newspapers of London, he uh, uh, refers to the Caracas Revolution. And, uh, and he signed it as a verdad, un verdadero americano, really American, not a Mexican a, a, a patriot, not a, a Venezuela or Spanish, but an American. And uh, it, 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 this is important because the, the networks uh, uh, across the Atlantic world, there are world most important that we can imagine. Uh, imagine it. Uh, I, I uh, will, uh, will tell you a little story. In, in July uh, 13, uh, 1821, uh, the ship Asia uh, arrived to Veracruz. Uh, it was the, the, the day, the birthday of uh, Juan Odonoju. Uh, the, the last viceroy of New Spain. Was, uh, Juan Odono, who was in, in, in the Asia, and uh, when he came to, to Veracruz, he saw a port with a, a yellow fever, with a, many deaths. Uh, the deaths were uh, in, the, in, in the beaches because the, the, the place was searched by Santana and uh, uh, the, the cemetery was outside the, 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 the port, the city. So the people that uh, they were, were in, the, in the beach are, and it was uh, 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 the, for uh, it for the vultures. For, uh, and uh, Odonohu uh, uh, knew that the old Mexico was in hands of the independent movement led by Agustin de Iturbide. And he also knew that the money of the uh, Spaniards, uh, Americans, were outside Veracruz. And the uh, colonel Santana uh, uh, prohibited the, the entrance of the money to the, to the port. So uh, Odonohu was negotiating, negotiating the, the the, uh, the uh, uh, for for the money of the Spaniards, with the support of Manuel Wall. Manuel Wall was son of a former governor of Nicaragua and cousin of uh, uh, Pedro Wall, a partner of uh, uh, Fermín de Paul. Fermín de Paul is a Caracan liberal that uh, uh, contributed to the signing of the Tratado de Trujillo, the, the Treaty of Peace between the Spanish monarchy and Simón Bolívar. And it's no, no, no coincidence that the Tratado de Córdoba, the Treaty of Córdoba, signed by Juan Odonohu and Agustín de Iturbide, it's a, a, a copy of the Tratado de Trujillo. Is, the, 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 we can see the, the networks of families, families will have interest in, in the commerce, interest in the, in the trade uh, uh, between uh, America and Spain that are trying to, to save some of the, of the, uh, of the business for, for, uh, in front of the independence of Mexico or, uh, or Colombia or, or Venezuela. It's uh, uh, very interesting uh, that Juan Odonohu was married with uh, Josefa Sánchez Barriga, the the uh, the daughter of uh, Manuel no Mateo Sanchez Barriga, a, a merchant that has a business with the father of Manuel Wal in Nicaragua and in Nueva Granada. So it's uh, it's an elite, a, a, a transatlantic elite of of traders that are interested in in, in maintaining. The, uh, uh, the business and maintain the uh, royalties of the, of the trade between Spain, Spain and Spanish America. Thank you. Um, that transitioned us really nicely into something else we wanted to talk about, which was that not everyone was convinced by independence. Um, not everyone wanted 
independence from Spain um, at whatever level. And so I was wondering, Marcella, if you could talk to us a little bit, again, as with kind of those who were fighting for independence existing across multiple social spheres, those who were fighting for staying with Spain were also kind of royalists were also kind of to be found everywhere, right? Yes, and uh, this has really been a, a topic that uh, I have been very interested in because uh, when you think about the people who didn't want independence, it's like the way you you introduce the topic, right? Which in 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 historiographical or historical terms are called the royalists, right? They're they're in favor of the crown. You already are assuming that there was something that was clearly the independence uh, project, right? So one of the things that I, I think is interesting about thinking uh, through the lens of royalism and the royalists is to actually undo that presupposition and to know that the people who supposedly wanted independence were a little bit more ambiguous themselves. Mm -hmm. And this also takes us back to the question of, of periodization or the date or how we think about the process, not so much in a linear way, but definitely in the type of steps that it took for people to really declare the independence as they did in, in the year 1821. So the royalists at the beginning, if we, if we want to be very bold, were everybody, right? So it's, it's actually not that like there were those choices to be made. Like even in what you were just telling us, it's clear that people initially were defending the Spanish monarchy against the French monarchy or the French Republic that had in, invaded and had now made it, you know, like completely uh, threatening the sovereignty of, of Spain in the Americas. Even in those texts that Jordana told us, initially historians have read an intention to be much more in favor of Spanish sovereignty than to declare any independence, you know, because that was not even the goal initially. But what is fascinating, and it has been the focus of my, of my research for many years, is to think about people who were from indigenous groups all across the, the Spanish Americas, or people of African descent, both free and enslaved, who predominantly were in favor of uh, the Spanish crown when this civil war did begin to take much more defined forms and, and when the, the, the antagonism became, became clear and these options kind of took a little bit more shape. And so the question really is what was going on behind that? And, and I think that what this tells us, the fact that it's, it was such a powerful option and also, you know, like uh, massive in, 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 in when we look at places like Venezuela where clearly uh, the majority of the population of African descent was defending uh, Spain, it has to, to do with the way they understood the monarchy and it once again forces us, I think, or invites us in a more gentle way to, <laughs> to think about the monarchy, not as something that was completely, you know, a, a dominating force, like the type of narrative that we are getting constantly from these uh, pro-independence leaders, but a monarchy that had generated, created, and, and established for centuries uh, up to that point, uh, relationships with people in which they could gain uh, certain types of rights. And that legally, uh, that was obviously a favorable moment to negotiate those rights when uh, the independence wars broke out. So in a way, loyalty was negotiated. It was not something that uh, represented some sort of, uh, you know, confusion or misunderstanding. But it really had to do with the opportunities that arose uh, on one hand militarily, but on the other hand, and I just I wanted to bring the Cais constitution in because we haven't talked about it as much, but it's a crucial dimension when you think about the legal transformations that took place within the Spanish monarchy during this decade. One of the major ones, and it's absolutely crucial to think about this revolutionary process is the, the, uh, the writing of a constitution that turned the bi-hemispheric uh, 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 monarchy into a constitutional monarchy. And so if we think through the lens of the Cadiz constitution, the question of royalism, which is again, something that was very uh, widespread, um, we can make even more sense of why people were 
be interpreting the, the monarchy in a, in a different way when the monarchy itself was offering new types of rights and uh, becoming more inclusive to larger sectors of the population, mainly indigenous people, for example, were uh, now considered citizens. And that was something that, again, gave new meaning to the monarchy through uh, their eyes. So that's like, in a nutshell, I think one, one of the ways to reinterpret the royalism, not to see it as, as, as a question of, like, again, I'm, I'm, I would love to hear how, how you have thought about it before, but generally it's something like the good and the bad, or, or you know, the, the ones who know and the ones who don't know, but it's actually very much more complex and interesting uh, if we think about it this way. No, that's, that's a fantastic way to think about it. And that gets us more also with the ways that, um, you know, liberalism and citizenship weren't reserved solely to the fight for independence. There were a lot of possibilities. There were a lot of options on the table, maybe for what could happen next um, in this moment, which brings us to something else that we wanted to talk about, which was the fact that not everywhere ended up independent. Um, not everywhere ended up a republic. But particularly, I think Professor Dim, Jordani, you wanted to talk a little bit to kind of the cases of Brazil and Cuba, which are the two, and you mentioned Panama earlier, you mentioned other places that remain colonial in one way or another, but these, these two places, kind of Brazil and Cuba especially, I was wondering if you could talk us through why they don't take part in this process that we're seeing up in a nice GIF on the, on the screen up there. <laughs> they do and they don't. Um, <laughs> The problem with being a historian is I think none of us see things in black and white, and um, we like to take apart all the certainty that National Independence Days tend to wish to celebrate. So, um, so Cuba and Brazil, I think, are two really interesting cases. Um, again, in, in North America, we tend to forget that Canada chose not to leave Great Britain in 1776, nor did uh, Jamaica or the islands in the Caribbean. And so, as, as Marcella was saying, sort of reading backwards, we, we tend to focus on, ah, yes, independence. There was a natural set of next steps after, you know, the French Revolution, the American Revolution, the Haitian Revolution. Obviously, the dominoes would fall and the rest of the Americas would become not only non-colonial, but also uh, Republican in their forms of government. And Brazil is a really interesting case uh, that uh, Kirsten Schultz has studied in, in, uh, in depth as well as many others in which the Napoleonic moment that um, we've been talking about when the, the French invade both Portugal and Spain, the Spanish king goes off to spend a very cushy exile in a French chateau um, and comes back to his throne from there. Whereas the Portuguese court get on a ship or several ships and supported by the British sail off to Rio de Janeiro, where they recreate the, the court life, um, bring artists, bring libraries, uh, establish um, a really new center to their empire. And it's the first time that the European monarchs come over to the Americas. And in fact, the only time. And they, they passed this whole war where um, the Napoleonic moment in, in Brazil, in so doing, they raised Brazil to the same status as Portugal in the empire. Rio becomes the de facto capital of, of the Portuguese empire. And by 1820, the Portuguese want their king to come home and he doesn't want to go back. And they have to call him back. And he goes, but he leaves his son and heir behind with the instructions that if it looks like things are getting dicey, this son, this prince, should declare Brazilian independence and achieve independence for Brazil so that the Braganza family can maintain its connection and those that, that sort of royalist sense. And long story short, very soon after the king leaves, um, the son, Dom Pedro, is... is compelled looking at sort of the way things are developing. Um, Portugal keeps trying to reduce the power of Brazil. So he gets out in front and he declares independence and is supported by the Brazilian elite. And Brazil is ruled by a monarchy until the 1880s, which is part of kind of our historical forgetting. So that constitutional monarchy, he, he follows the path like Spain did, adopts um, a constitution, retains slavery. Brazil is a, an economy that is based on um, slave labor. 
Uh, and in the end, it's not until the end of the 19th century, Brazil abolishes slavery and also um, transitions to fully to a democratic republic. So it's an interesting model. Uh, Mexico, where I'm sure Professor Avila could talk more um, about that in 1821, is also experimenting with constitutional monarchy. So it's not a foregone conclusion that you'll wind up with a republic. Cuba, I will just say uh, in a word, chooses not to declare independence when all of these other places are doing so. And there are a lot of complicated reasons. Uh, Professor John Sartorius, I think, has written very extensively about this. But it doesn't mean that they're not participating, as Marcela has said, in all of these conversations. They adopt the Constitution of Cadiz. They're looking for political reform. But their economic system, their political, the power of elites, is actually well served by Spain well into the 19th century. So it's not until many years after most of the mainland has cut ties that Cuba, um, which is also trading extensively, buying wheat from the United States, um, all sorts of things go on, but it's not until much later in the century that an independence movement wants to walk away from Spain. So it's, it really is this rich moment of experimentation where um, the ties remain between all of these places, but they're choosing different paths towards um, serving their own people and, and making um, their societies work. Yeah, Alfredo, you wanna yeah. jump in on that? Because I think we would like to hear a little bit more about the Mexican context here and, and yeah, the, the ways in which not, not everyone thought republicanism was the way to go, even yes. if independence was coming. Well, so uh, uh, there were many kinds of liberalisms in, 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 in the early 19th century in Spanish America. Uh, and the, the monarchical option was, was one uh, uh, of, uh, of those uh, possibilities and was one option for, for many people. Uh, in, in 88, uh, uh, Bernardino Rivadavia, uh, uh, Bernardino uh, uh, Rivadavia uh, in, the, in the 20s became the, the first president of, of Argentina, the uh, minister of Buenos Aires, the president of Argentina. And uh, uh, he proposed a, a monarchy for, for, for Rio de la Plata. Uh, Carlota Joaquina, the, the wife of Joao, uh, uh, the prince uh, of uh, uh, Portugal and Brazil, uh, uh, proposed uh, to be a, a, a queen or, 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 uh, or uh, governor or regent or something like that uh, to the Spanish American uh, 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 territories. And even in 1820, Jose de San Martin in, uh, in Lima, in, in the negotiations uh, in, Mira, in Miraflores with the Spanish authorities, he proposed a, a monarchy for, uh, for Peru. He, he said that Peru was an older uh, visa royalty and uh, uh, probably the Peruvians will be better with a monarch than with a king uh, than in a republic. Uh, uh, San Martin argued that the, the republic was good for uh, Buenos Aires, Rio de la Plata, Chile, and Colombia, but probably Peru could, could be a monarchy. And uh, uh, the idea of, uh, of monarchies, and, and monarchies uh, uh, with, uh, of the royal family, of the Spanish royal family, no, no any, uh, uh, any king, but uh, 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 the brothers or, or, or of Fernando VII, of the king of Spain. Uh, this proposal was made in Europe also. Uh, in, in 1817, uh, um, Alvaro Flores Estrada in London published a book uh, 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 on the Spanish-American revolutions, and, uh, and he said that the, the independence is a good idea because in Spain uh, uh, were the absolutist regime of, of Fernando, and Americans and the Americanos were uh, fighting for liberty, for rights, uh, and, and equality. So uh, independence could be a good idea for Americans, but uh, he preferred, he, he said, that uh, uh, the, in America were constituted monarchies with uh, uh, Spanish kings, with Spanish princes. So uh, in, in 1820, uh, Labbé de Prat, uh, a French clergyman, uh, wrote a, a book about the same uh, subject. And uh, Prat said that uh, Spain was in a terrible crisis. So uh, 
Spain was incapable of a reconquest the, the, the Spanish territories. So uh, the best idea for Spain, for Spain was the possibility to take three countries, three countries, independent countries in America with a prince, a brother or a, a member of the royal Spanish family. So it's an idea that was uh, discussed, uh, was in, in, in the public opinion. And, and Agustin de Turbide took the, the participate in the discussion. And the plan of Iguala, the plan of February of 1821, it said that Mexico will be an a, a, a empire, an independent empire with constitution, but with a, a king uh, uh, that could be Fernando VII or one of his brothers. So it's a, a possibility in, in, in 1821. And probably it's the possibility more uh, uh, accepted. Uh, uh, in, in, in the Atlantic world, but in New Spain uh, too. Uh, the uh, constitutional monarchy was uh, uh, an acceptable idea for uh, insurgents like Vicente, Vicente Guerrero, because he's independent, but for conservative people like, uh, like Monteagudo, because you have a, a monarch, uh, a king. And in, in the Atlantic world, it could be a good idea because you can maintain the uh, trade and the, the network, uh, the commercial network between Europe and, and America. So all, all, are, all are winning. It's a, it's a good idea for, for them. That also then kind of brings us to, okay, so 1821 is the year that we're celebrating now. And I was wondering if each of you kind of could reflect on the region. Alfredo, you've given us a little bit about where Mexico was in 1821. Don't know if either of you would like to reflect on other parts of Latin America that you're more expert in and kind of what was going on in 1821. Is this a year to celebrate elsewhere? Um, is this the year that is celebrated elsewhere or kind of where does 1821 as a year leave us in Latin America kind of writ large? So fortunately, um, we're not going far in many senses. Um, the Mexican uh, independence movement, uh, in fact, unleashed. Central America was also fairly conservative. It wasn't pushing for independence from Spain very much. It was very happy with the constitutional monarchy. It was happy with the chance. The elites were happy to, happy is a, probably too kind of word, but they were, they were enthusiastic about having more say in self-government. They found that the, a Spanish system where they they could elect leaders to go to Spain and be participate in constitutional debates and cortes or parliaments, where they could have elected officials come together to offset some of the power of Spanish governors and Spanish courts uh, in the isthmus were good. But as Mexico was getting closer and closer to independence and the forces were getting closer and closer, um, Chiapas, which uh, <clears throat> to Mexicans is part of Mexico, but to Central Americans was part of the Reino de Guatemala just a bit further south, um, was the first part of Central America to declare its independence in 1821 in August. And long story short, when the news reached the capital of Guatemala City, the elites came together and they called for um, a Congress to come together and decide whether to become independent or not. So September 15th, uh, 1821 is celebrated as the day of independence from um, Guatemala through Costa Rica, even though between 1821 and 1822 when they joined Mexico and then 1823 when they left and 1825 when they got, <laughs> and 1823 July 1st was the real declaration of independence and 1825 when they established a federation that fell apart in the 1830s and became five different countries. They all celebrate uh, September 15th, 1821 as independence. So again, this is, I, I study Central America. It is the most fictional independence day one could possibly have, but it is very important symbolically and politically and in terms of unity. Um, so uh, this is a very important year. There are many events going on in Central America, but historically wait till 1823, we'll do it again. That was really interesting, and and it's it's same thing for me. Luckily, I don't think we're going to have someone who can actually say that, no. It's in twenty one is not important because I 
have been studying uh, for the most part Colombia, right? And, and uh, that's exactly the year when it is founded and you already said it. It's the, the constitution that creates the Republic of Colombia, which by the way is different from the present day Colombia. It includes what today are Venezuela, Panama and Ecuador. So it really is big and that's partly why they have called it Gran Colombia. Um, very important constitutional process. We're also having, you know, celebratory events around this constitution, partly to think about something that connects with what we were saying in relation to, to Cadiz and, and the, the Spanish constitutional experiment, which is that constitutional texts really gained a lot of, not just symbolic power, but like that they were the means for really giving life to these new uh, institutional forms and, and, and corporate uh, experiments. So the story with Colombia, perhaps very similar to what you just said, Jordana, is, is complicated. I mean, it, it is a grand beginning, but it's relatively short-lived. It only lasts, uh, well, half a decade, and then it really starts to, to get into a very complicated situation and eventually dissolves, as you know. But I still think that it's worth commemorating and remembering and re re revisiting, right, in terms of trying to understand really what happened then. That's what we're doing again collectively with, with a large community of scholars. And I would just highlight something that for me is particularly important, which is, for example, that the Republic of Colombia is going to begin as an abolitionist republic. It's uh, envisioning the end of slavery as a gradual process. So it's not a, a automatic emancipation of slaves, but nonetheless, it really lets us see how crucial this uh, intersection was in the process of, of Colombian independence. As actually, it was in all of Spanish, uh, mainland Spanish America, the idea that these republics were anti-slavery republics and these were written in the constitutional texts from the beginning. Now, as, as Jordana said, historians will not be happy with that simple uh, statement. Of course, it's more complicated than just writing this into the constitution. What is interesting is to see how that unleashes incredible political struggles, fights, you know, between people who were in favor and against abolition. But of course, it's also another way of getting at the historical presence of the people of African descent in Colombia and across this very wide region who are going to be very much invested in making sure that this is going to, to happen, even if it takes uh, three more decades to actually uh, completely abolish slavery in, in these three countries, uh, Colombia, well, New Granada, uh, Venezuela, and Ecuador, uh, Panama included in, in New Granada. So it's a, it's a really fundamental moment and again, it's a, a rich uh, period for us as historians to think about. So, well, well and, uh, 1821 is an important uh, moment, but also for Peru is, is the, the year in the, uh, in the, the, the troops of uh, San Martin uh, uh, conquest Lima and uh, uh, the royalist government of Peru uh, go to, to Cusco and then to the Alto Peru, uh, uh, currently Bolivia. And, but I, I want to say that it's a very important year also for Europe. Uh, in Europe, in 1820, uh, 1821, uh, Portugal, Richard Stites worked, uh, uh, did work about this uh, uh, years ago. It's a revolutionary time for Portugal, for Spain, for Naples, for Greece. So it's uh, uh, the, the 20s, the beginning of the 20s is a, a, a period of revolutions in uh, the Mediterranean world and in the uh, Spanish American world. So uh, I think that we can uh, uh, take a big picture of uh, a world in changing in, in, in those years. Thank you very much for that. And I think that's a wonderful place to wrap up, especially with this, I, the, the idea of this series of conversations being about Mexico just, in the context of age of, <laughs> yeah. of revolutions. Because you know the age of revolutions, as somewhat originally imagined, or as many people imagine it, is France and the United States, and then Haiti, and only recently has Latin America kind of been inserted into that. If you look at kind of popular conceptions of it, 
but to extend it back to Europe as well is, is really important. And so, so to, to broaden out what age of revolutions means as a period, but also as kind of who is, who is contributing what, kind of which countries are essential to that process um, is I think a really wonderful place for us to wrap up if, and open it up for, for questions from the audience. Um, if anyone wants to step up, there's a microphone there in the middle. If you feel like you can shout or be loud, if you wouldn't mind taking it around the, the microphone around, that could also work. open that up to anyone who wants to respond to it, but just this kind of question of kind of what how what ideas were circulating among Latin American elites and then how do we think about kind of ideas of unity then in relation to maybe ideas of unity, regional unity now. Colombia had initially in, in also spearheading this, this concept of uh, federation. I, I, you may know, in fact, that may be what you're thinking about when you pose this very interesting question of unity, because if we're used to thinking about independence as consolidating these nations and kind of fracturing the territory, as, as we see it actually in the images there as well, um, there were ideas that circulated, and one of them was by Simon Bolivar himself, of creating a confederation that he actually proposed to meet in Panama in 1826. So, but he began with this idea, well, much earlier, and convoking or inviting people, making connections. I mean, this is a period also we have to think about very intense diplomatic activity between the emergent republics and you know the United States and 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 also uh, the countries in Europe, but in fact also among themselves, which is very important, I think, to to consider what you're saying that there was always the 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 possibility of establishing a a, a type of um, like supranational uh, uh, form of government that would allow these Hispanic republics to unite in part to, to, to protect themselves from European aggressions, as we know, I mean, independence was always a, a very uh, kind of a tentative uh, kind of situation and they had to be sure that they could be united in case of an, uh, an aggression. But how the past uh, connects to the present is I think an, another question that maybe <laughs> somebody else wants to talk. Uh, uh, no, I, I just to say that, that the history and, and I think the present also uh, always is uh, uh, much more complicated. Yeah. 
Yes, Simon Bolivar was thinking in a confederation, but but uh, the the first uh, uh, minister of Simon Bolivar in Mexico, Miguel Santa Maria, uh, was a, a, an enemy of the Mexican government. Uh, uh, Santa Maria once conspirated against Agustin de Iturbide, and, and uh, uh, Marcela say, say uh, uh, Colombia includes Panama, and the Mexican Empire includes uh, Costa Rica. So uh, Mexico and Colombia were uh, neighbors. Uh, and, and for Simón Bolívar, uh, have a neighbor in, in, in the north so powerful like, like the Mexican Empire is dangerous for, for, for uh, his country. So it's, it's OK, yes. Uh, there, there were um, many uh, attempts of, of union, but in the negotiations in Panama or in Tacubaya in 1826, the interests of each country uh, uh, were, uh, were more important than the, the, the project of union. So uh, uh, the, the past learned us uh, uh, the, the complicated situation. And I think in the present also uh, uh, occurs the same thing. If I can rephrase that a little bit, I was, I, I think what you're trying to ask of our wonderful historians up here is um, when does the word America start to only mean United States? Um, and is there ever, or kind of, is the conception of the Americas or of American as something more expansive? Does it have durability? Does it stop existing in a certain moment? Is there a way um, to think about America as beyond the United States? I remember when, when Miguel Hidalgo made the, the revolution in, in Guanajuato, he, he said that he was fighting for the independence of this America. The, uh, uh, this America, the American, uh, uh, the America of the North, America septentrional. And uh, when Jose Maria Morelos uh, 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 convoked the, the Congress in Chilpancingo, he said the, the America of, uh, of septentrion, the America, or again, America uh, of North. And uh, finally, in, 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 in the 14, when Morelos uh, uh, begins to uh, employ the, the, the term, uh, America Mexicana, uh, Mexican America, or, uh, uh, or Republic, uh, or the Mexican Republic. Uh, uh, but it's, it's later, it's in, in the 14, no, no, no later. So, uh, I, I don't know, the, the, there were no national identities, uh, but also there were uh, identities uh, in the provinces, in the regional uh, identities. But the, the Mexic when, when the Mexican Empire fell, the, the result of the, the, the subsequent country was not a republic, was a lot of provinces, of independent provinces, of independent states. Uh, 
eh, Yucatán, eh, Oaxaca, Jalisco, eh, Puebla, but also Chiapas, Guatemala. Eh, uh, don't forget that the, uh, with, the fall, uh, with the fall of the, the Mexican Empire, uh, um, was born two federal republics, no one, no Mexico, the Mexican Federation and the Central American Federation. Because the, the identities, the regional identities were very important for, for those people. I can't tell you when it ends, but one thing just to think about that term Americanos was used against Espanoles, right? So there's a long-standing tradition in the Spanish American world of those people, particularly of European heritage or a mixed heritage, identifying themselves as Americanos and not Europeos. And so part of the reason I think that term was so important in this period is that was something that those who were fighting for um, autonomy and later sovereignty shared, which was more, more local power, more regional power against Spanish power. So it really is this interesting question and the United States participated in Bolivar's conference, begrudgingly <laughs> didn't want a federation, but they were Americanos in the same way where their Europeans were British. Um, so in, in some sense, Americanos actually works for the region, but it's true that somewhere along the way, um, right, well, I don't, somewhere between 1821 and 2021, <laughs> <laughs> something happened, and I guess I'm not sure when. We need to start doing some of the, the large-scale textual analysis that is yes. possible now with digitized newspapers and see when <laughs> one term stops and the other starts. Do we have it? Yeah, exactly. I know there's, there's too many different Americans. I believe uh, you mentioned early that Paris Constitution, 1812. And I think, uh, yeah, those indigenous became citizens would it also deny the African, African African people citizenship as a right of property? That you know, I think in that constitution, and then you have people like Morelos, who was in Bonato and Bolivar in 1816, you know, to start really to get involved in those battles. And also at the end of the independence, at the beginning, the African descent were with the realista, but at the end, the African descent people like Bolivar and people like that. Support the independence and the indigenous work with the realist army, like in Querétaro, we have, you know, support with the realist. So they then always change, and, you know, because uh, Bolivar goes to Alto Peru, Bolivar, and Bolivia, and this is more by indigenous, like Che Guevara in the 20th century. So I mean, uh, Bolivar and his Afro, you know, soldiers were not the indigenous, they were not the the Republic of Nigeria to, to support the crown. So you have all these tensions fight. I mean, I think the book, the book, the book the way you talk about that. So I think it's more complicated. And uh, we want to talk only about the links in the city to also uh, people who were living in the city in the countryside. They were always uh, moving in and out. Would you like to respond at all? So can... <laughs> um, no, no, I think, I mean, I, I really like uh, that your invitation to talk more about the question of indigenous participation, because first of all, it, it, one of the things I understood you were saying is that uh, it's, it's incredibly varied the way that not only indigenous people existed. And so when we say that word, we're all obviously using a shorthand for something that is really incredibly diverse uh, geographically, like the, like there's uh, different types of belonging, there's different types of uh, positions vis-a-vis -vis the monarchy, for example, there's indigenous people who are much more, uh, if you will, integrated into the, into the monarchy economically and politically. There's people who are still relatively on the margins and maintaining a, 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 a you know a larger degree of autonomy and it's interesting that even those people which is uh, might be the case of in chile for example might have 
been willing to go in favor of the monarchy at the moment of the of the crisis in part because uh, circumstances were always changing right and so uh, I think I'm not sure if it was one of you just said something up when you were saying like uh, these identities are relational right so it really depends who you are confronting that is going to really define also your your loyalty or the types of alliances that you're willing to make um, but but I think I said you said something else it, 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 like connecting the Cayes constitution to the Spanish sorry the Colombian constitution of 1821 that is interesting to remark as well which is that yes uh, some historians have argued that that Cadiz was much more generous than the, the constitutions that came later and that the Spanish American republics are going to kind of redefine the exclusion of indigenous people. And, and that's why the history, I mean, it's almost like a, a moving target, if you will, of, of this question of indigenous citizenship in Latin America. And of course, when you think about that, that problem, it's not just what the laws are saying, but what the indigenous people themselves are doing with the laws, in dialogue with the laws, and then obviously to to change them or or, or you know to to engage with them. So I think that there's multiple dimensions to to that story, and and all of them are are quite important. So thank you for that point. I think we have time for one more question before. Yes. I would like the three of you to engage in a little bit of counterfactual history if you want to, you don't have to. But my question is that, of course, in the popular image of the independence of Latin America, uh, it ha independence happened because it's the natural and logical thing to happen. They were colonies oppressed by an imperial power and so on and so forth. Historians know a little better that everything started in, with the Napoleonic invasion of the Iberian Peninsula. So the question is, uh, and I remember reading from some historian who argued that without the invasion of Napoleon and the overthrow of the Spanish monarchy and the exile or the flee of the Portuguese monarchy to uh, Rio de Janeiro, uh, uh, this uh, uh, territories could have been uh, stayed as part of the monarchy, the Spanish monarchy, another 100 years. Uh, we know that in the case of Cuba, that was going to happen no matter what, because the, the, the ruling elites were scared of the Haitian revolution and all of that. But what about in the case of Mexico, Colombia, and Central America? Without the uh, Napoleonic invasion, uh, do you, as people, as historians who have studied independence in detail, do you have a sense that uh, was independence in inevitable or this was an accident of history that without that people accident of history, uh, the things would have stayed, uh, stayed the same? <laughs> I know historians take counterfactuals, but... No, I, I think it's a really great question. Thank you so much for, for posing it because at the beginning I said something that was meant to kind of address that, that, that potential. <laughs> kind of a conundrum, which is that uh, politics existed before the Napoleonic invasion. I mean, we don't want, I mean, this is kind of like a debate that is going on right now. We don't want to mystify that so much as to say, uh, this is really what granted, like for example, people in the Americas, the possibility or the option to become politicized, right? Like we, we want to see the events of the 1808 onward as really founded or, or, or standing upon politics, like even the things that you said about, uh, you know, the documents or the ideas that were already there. In terms of conflict, there are many possible uh, examples of, of um, let's say, rebellions or confrontations or anti-colonial posturing that, that really was aiming to transform these circumstances locally. So in a way, the question is, would it have happened at a continental scale like it did, which is, I think, what it makes the, the moment of the Napoleonic invasion so, so interesting for us to see how it, it kind of spreads all across the empire because of the, of the structural uh, damage that, that the, the monarchical crisis represents. 
But for example, if you go back to 1781 with the Tupac Amaru um, insurrection in Peru, you already see a very big, significant and destabilizing force precisely connecting to what we were talking about a second ago, the, uh, the indigenous people themselves leading uh, a re revolt against Spain. And there you see evidence of very important uh, ideas that are again, anti-colonial and that therefore give the sense that the, the, the empire was not as stable as it, as, as, as it seemed or that, you know, there, the, precisely they take us back to the age of revolutions. Like it was a moment of instability for, for these uh, European monarchies all across the board. But I, I, I would love to hear what you think about this. I'll add a reading to the list. Um, and I'm so glad you mentioned Tupac Amaru because that failed moment of um, re reclaiming territory for an Inca empire uh, is left out of the narrative the way, same way the Haitian revolution was also left out of the narrative. And the story of Spanish or Latin American independence changes enormously if that's the starting point instead of the French revolution or the American revolution. And, and I was taught that by a bunch of high school students in Chicago this spring. Um, where I was trying like, well, how is this really a revolutionary moment? They were interested in social justice. Of all of the movements in some way, it was the one that pushed farthest. So the reading I would actually recommend is another counterfactual um, called a book by a French writer called Laurent Binet called Civilizations, which is the best um, reimagining of the conquest period because it takes Atahualpa to Europe and the Incas conquer the European empire, but it's smart. It's, it's really based and steeped in, in the period. Um, and there's nothing better than reading Columbus failing um, and why. So if you're looking for a good counterfactual read, I recommend Civilizations. Well, I think we'll wrap up there for now. And I want to thank again, all of you for your, your generous questions and for taking part tonight. And of course, to our wonderful panelists for taking part in this conversation. I learned a huge amount and I think it's going to generate a lot of conversations going forward as well. So we invite you all to join us in the, in the next room over for some music um, and some cocktails and snacks if you would like to. So thank you again for joining us and, and we hope to see you in the next few days too. Thank you.